we're going to reconvene with our IoT panel with two esteemed panelists, the thoughtfully posed Michelle Fitzhugh. I love your picture back there. Uh, and, and, <laughs> and I've got it figured out. That's what that says. Then again, I'm doing the same thing in my photo. So, uh, And then Jim Hunter, who is Chief Scientist and Technology Evangelist with GreenWave Systems. So thank you for being here. Thank so, you for having us. Yeah. Thank you. So let's start about just what you're doing um, in IoT, and then we can get into some questions. So, Michelle, I'll start with you. Sure. I'm Michelle Fitzhugh. I'm a Senior Business Development Manager responsible for IoT at T-Mobile. And what I'm doing? Yeah. So what, I'm, what, I'm what is Uncarrier? Evangelizing yes, IoT, of yes, course. But I want to, you're wearing the brand. You've got, it's not pink, it's magenta going. It's magenta. So I want to know how one can be Uncarrier in IoT. Um, Solving customer pain oh, points. Oh, whoa. All right. That's, that's nice to get, that's to get carried away. So we'll get back to that. And so then, Jim, tell us, tell us about yourself and GreenWave. Yeah, absolutely. So I am the uh, technology evangelist and the chief scientist for GreenWave. And what that simply means is I can actually speak consumer speak and technology speak because both of those need to be bridged together to actually make usable product. So what GreenWave does is we provide a platform uh, for IoT that actually bridges a wider definition of IoT than a lot of people actually look at, specifically as it applies to consumers. So for us, IoT, smart home is one of those square peg round holes that fits into that description, but so is entertainment, and so is networking, and so is you know, mobile you. For us, it's really, IoT is an interesting term, but it's really the internet of you. And as a consumer applies, that, that's what we really look at, is how do we extract the value of the internet of you? Right, so folks might be a little less familiar with GreenWave, so I'll, I'll start with you. When we talked on the phone, you said you were an ingredient brand. So kind of what devices or what services do you power? Who are your customers? Yeah, absolutely. So for IoT, there's a, there's a number of devices, hero devices and, and, and secondary devices that are out there to gather data, to create context. And it's those devices that are made by third parties that we want to communicate with. Our software doesn't have to go into those endpoints. It shouldn't have to, otherwise you don't have a scalable solution. However, there's a meeting point at which a certain type of a radio needs to bridge into IP or a certain type of a protocol that with security elements uh, has to actually bridge into a device. Sometimes that device is a gateway, it could be a Wi-Fi extender, a set-top box, some form factor that enables the existing technologies to extend and, and be fortified to be better and then to extend new networks into them. So for example, with one of our customers, they have a wide deployment, about three million broadband routers in the home, and there happens to be a Z-Wave chip. Z-Wave is one of those many, many home protocols for connecting devices like lights and thermostats and all of these devices. So this device, we helped that company fortify their existing solution, and then we extended them into brand new IoT offerings so that they can offer new products and services to their customers. Can you say who that customer is? Yes, because it's public knowledge, okay, Verizon. Just, okay. Yeah. And then you Verizon. yourself were at Four Home and Motorola, so there's kind of a long Verizon lineage or relationship there. So. Yeah, thank you for bringing time into this. Uh, I've been doing, uh, working in IoT for about 24 years. Uh, personally founded two companies and sold them both to Motorola in IoT. The last one was called Four Home. I'm not trying to say you're old, but... I'm, I'm picking up that you are. Okay. But it's okay. Michelle, you recently joined T-Mobile from AT&T. That's right. Do they, do they pay the ETF when you do that or no? Sorry, just kidding, sorry. Of course they did. Okay. So what brought you over and then what are you focused on? In well, you know, John Ledger, if you guys haven't seen him, he's pretty exciting and rambunctious and disruptive and that was an interesting uh, component of why I joined the, the team. But in particular, IoT is very interesting. You know, 50 billion connections by 2020. That's exciting. Specifically, um, T-Mobile has come out and said, we're going to keep 2G on the air, um, and perhaps... December 2020, so as a way to enable and continue to enable the, the low-cost, low-bandwidth devices, we'll maintain the 2G network through 2020, okay. which is a huge help to uh, folks that are being sort of left behind, I should say, on someone else's network. Disenfranchised? Yes. Yes. So, is that a big number? And are folks starting? Are, like, are the people? I'm drawing my past experience in fleet tracking, and we were working with At Road, and they had CDPD radios in their car, and people weren't going to switch until they really had to. 
um, or they were going to complain about it. So are folks calling you or are they just, are they going to wake up one day and their phone's not going to work in, in their 2G IoT device? The phones are ringing off the hook because, you know, we just announced a promotion where we're providing 2G AT&T customers free service and free SIMs. We can swap them out. We think that there's millions still connected on AT&T's 2G network. All right, well, that's exciting, and we'll, we'll keep an eye out for that. So, uh, question for Jim. So, if you're an ingredient brand in a hub product in the home, you probably have some visibility as to what folks are actually doing in the home. Can you kind of characterize sort of the patterns of home engagement that you see? Yeah, absolutely. So, I, I guess the question always becomes, you know, in this evolution of compute that we're calling IoT, what's the new killer app? That's, that's a great question. Anybody know the answer to that? Yeah, exactly. No. So the, the killer app is still yet to be identified, but there are some that are close to that. And like I mentioned to you, IoT for us, entertainment is something that actually is close to being a killer app. So there's a lot of entertainment, there's a lot of interaction with entertainment, and there's a, there's a lot of interaction with technology in general. I think that the most interesting thing that we're seeing from consumers, and it's really being driven by the demands now that we're getting from our big customer base of telcos and, and operators, is the ability to kind of reduce the friction between the consumers and their technology. So voice is a really interesting thing. The things that Amazon has done, the things that Nuance has done. Um, so, so Amazon has the Echo product. Nuance is in 85% of the cars today. It's in the Comcast offering with X1. The ability to talk to your things and have them understand you, and, and we saw the IBM Watson folks up here. Um, this technology is not going away. What it's going to do is evolve. As we start to work AI into this, the, Command and control is where we are today. I can tell it to do something and it does it. That's great, but where we're moving is towards conversation. Life is conversational, and we believe that the technology that's around your life is easier if it's communicated with the same way I communicate with my friends and family. So not just conversation from voice, conversation from social, all of these things are, are paramount to being able to engage and use technology. The, the biggest problem that we have is technologists create technology. I, I'm one, so I can actually say that. These technologists say, oh, we're going to create this product and put it in the store, and we're going to call it a programmable thermostat. And everybody's going to scramble out and buy a programmable thermostat. They're not. They may hear in this area, but they're really not because they're doctors and lawyers and teachers, and programming is not necessarily their strong suit or something that drags them in droves to the store. So we have to elevate that usability discussion. So you've hit probably three or four interesting points that I'm not sure I can synthesize all of them, but the notion of voice being sort of the command medium, so to speak, implies a box in the home that's listening or a box somewhere that's listening. And you mentioned nuance in the car, so where my mind goes, is there kind of pan environment presence? Like if a consumer in the home can then go in the car, talk to their car, are they able to interact with the same service? Is there kind of persistence in sessions, for example? Yeah, that's definitely the direction things are going. It's, so, so the idea, if you think about the products that are there today, the first ver version of that product was found in a single room, the kitchen. Now it's actually in multiple rooms, so we're expanding the zone, expanding the reach, and the next generation of that is just to kind of expand even further into, into my home away from home, my car, into my hotel room, whatever I, I am doing in a portable fashion. I think that's the natural evolution of this because it's, while we talk about voice and we talk about command and control, it's really about an agent for your life. Right? Something that can actually take care of all that heavy lifting for me like I've had promised forever and to do so in a way that it's not just about my home and my entertainment, but it's about my life which includes the rest of the world. Is there anyone who's doing that well? Like really empowering your life? Um, I, I wrote an article in VentureBeat a few months back about um, Google. And I think that when they announced their Allo, it kind of, they talked about Google Home and that device they're putting in. But Allo is an interesting, interesting product if you look at it because one of the original members of your Allo network is Allo itself. And it's an AI engine that you can chat to and communicate to just like you would a search engine. So you can ask it about things that are both in your network and in your world, and it can answer those questions for you. That's the beginning of an agent. Um, and we're not talking about Clippy, the agent from Microsoft so many years ago. We're talking about something much more interactive and usable. Clippy. So many things. Uh, 
Uh, Michelle, you've got some news that you're going to be talking about later on the main stage, I think, with the good folks at Twilio. Can you at least give a little teaser as to what folks might sure, hear on the main stage? Sure. Award-winning, by the way, the uh, simple and programmable interface to, a, to our network, essentially easy access and available for ideally the developer community, but really enabling innovation. Um, so please go to the main stage in a few minutes and check out the presentation and case study there. But not until after this panel is over, <laughs> mind you. She's here for at least another 10 minutes. So, but, so it's interesting you partnered with a company that essentially provides developer tools and in a way abstracts away telecom -y stuff. So were you getting requests from developers? What you mentioned problem solving. So what problem were you trying to solve and how did you come to pick Toyota? I, I think simple and easy. I think it becomes very complex to, to find out who the modem manufacturers are, to get cellular connections, especially if you're, you know, a couple guys in a, in a, you know, a garage building something new. And so enabling the long tail too. Some of these uh, products that they're developing are going to take and we don't know what they are. And so if you were to work through Tool, do you get like a bundle of T-Mobile SIMs or what kind of, how, how, to what hardware level does this go, for example? You you know, I, Jasper was just on stage, so I'm thinking Jasper at one end and Twilio on this end, like how far, can you go Jasper-ish in a way? In terms of hardware, what do you mean? So going, I, I think of Twilio as helps you develop a, an app or a service, for example, but if you actually wanted to make a prototype, for example, you know, do you have kind of T-Mobile reference designs that a device maker uh, could use, for example. I think I think that there is a product that Twilio is marketing that can be sold with the connectivity. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. So that will be there'll be more on that on the main stage later. So please uh, save all your hardball questions for the Twilio folks. Yes. Actually, I can add, I can add in the Twilio. So we use Twilio actually as two-factor authentication. So one of the big challenges we see again with the the usability around voice is the idea that I don't know who it is necessarily that's that's talking. So. The idea that somebody could yell loud enough outside of my front door and say, unlock the door, and Amazon say, oh, yeah, no problem, I'll unlock the door for you, that's a problem. So we implement uh, two-factor authentication for devices that you want to be more secure. And we use Twilio for that. So when I say unlock the door, it says, hey, I'm going to remind you of the secure device. Tell me the code, the one-time code I just sent to your cell phone. And then you read that back, and then it knows that you're authorized to see it. So we use that kind of communication and that... Uh, two steps process when you have more secure products, so it works for that. This sounds like iRobot or, <laughs> or something that could be in that. So, okay, well, I'm glad that so have there been cases of people's voices being recorded and played back, so to speak, for nefarious purposes? Uh, no, not at all. Um, <laughs> so, I, I think let's be clear you, you mentioned earlier it's an always listening device. Right. I think one of the things that the press is getting wrong and some folks are getting wrong is they're confusing one company that had a TV that was always listening to everything being said, not to be named here, and a product like the Echo that's actually only listening for one word. The chip that's inside of it only listens for one key word. It's called the wake up word. And that's a huge difference from actually listening to the entire conversation, maybe streaming it somewhere. Now, those are the, some of the dangers. Privacy is a massive danger that we have within IoT. I'm the co-chair of the Privacy and Security Committee for the Internet of Things Consortium. And we're really focused on identifying how to alleviate the fears that you, know, you just came up with, that, that a lot of the consumers are gonna have as we go forward with regards to things that I'm saying, things that I'm doing, the context that I'm creating, the data pixels that are being generated from my context that will lead to data pictures, that will lead to data movies, that will socially indict me five years from now for what I'm doing right now. I did have an experience where I inadvertently taught my kids how to voice search. My son was like five, and he was searching for things on Siri, and so had that experience. He wasn't necessarily emulating my voice, but he was emulating the steps he'd seen a big person use to find stuff, and so you know, that sort of. You're, he's he's going to be a hacker. That's that's definitely hacker characteristics. We have we have high hopes. So be proud. <laughs> I certainly am. Um, so, uh, Michelle, we, were, we talked a little bit about autonomous cars, and there was, a, I guess, a, a pilot that you and Nokia Siemens had worked on um, in Michigan that I'd love to hear more about. So. Well, I think it, I, we were talking about the, the recent 5G trials with Ericsson and Nokia in terms of getting to the, the 10 gigabits per second speeds. Yes. Um, you're referring to a trial that was done a couple years back, I think, around edge computing almost. Correct. And, um, so can't speak specifically to that at this point. Okay. 
Sorry. <laughs> Not a problem. <laughs> okay. So there was a, a pilot uh, T-Mobile had done essentially that enabled hairpinning, so much lower latency response between base station and car. Lower latency is safer for autonomous cars, and that seemed like kind of a, both a big and cool thing to do. So, um, all right. Um, so you had talked about the time domain, and so I want to get to your futurist cap. So we were talking a little bit about what the state of the world today, what you see, but we've gotten a little bit towards what you see coming. And so I'd love to do that. So, yeah. So I think that I think that what we're going to have to see for the technology, and I mentioned it earlier, is it's going to have to become more usable. It's going to have to come something that actually, you know, what we see in the, the industry over and over and over is things get commoditized lower in the stack, and as we move up, that's where the value is found. And I think that we're seeing that in all kinds of aspects. And and communication is one of these things that the pipe is becoming a little bit of a commodity except for disruptive companies like T-Mobile. But as we're raising that, now it's about the conversation. Now it's about the engagement. Now it's about the information behind that. And I think as we move forward with technology, that the more we are able to gather context, we're having a conversation right now. Sure. And it's not just voice. It's actually, you're looking, uh, you're looking in my eyes as we're talking. And that's great, by the way. Um, and um, gestures, and we're just this whole back and forth moonily. activity. Moonily. I'm looking moonily into your eyes, yes. Can we tweet that? He's looking moonily into my eyes. It was a great panel. I just wanted to work that into a telecom council panel. But the gestures and the things that I'm doing actually create as much information as, 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 uh, as they are independently. So I could actually be talking to you very nicely, but making a gesture that's not very nice, and, and there's a certain different you know, connotation that's added, and you take away a different information. I think that we're going to start to see more of that in technology, more of that in the home, more of that in our cars, is being able to kind of pick up on more than one single signal, which might be my voice, and, and to figure out what the actual intent and the, and the desire of the person who's speaking will be. I was going to say that implies a diversity of inputs beyond voice, perhaps. So IoT. Yes. Absolutely. So we're on three minutes. I know we have at least one member of the press sitting up front. Um, um, so I wanted to see if we have any questions for our esteemed panelists on the subject of IoT. So if not, I can start calling on people. So hand way in the back. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my, my question is around uh, embedded connectivity for these IoT devices. And I know this isn't a question that T-Mobile probably would like to answer, but uh, specifically eSIM and, and your views on it in terms of you know, future-proofing connected devices. So eSIM with T-Mobile is available now, basically being able to upload multiple carrier profiles and enabling the supply chain to go cross borders. Is your question around long-term embedded devices and how we maintain you know, those devices in the field for? No, I wasn't aware, I, I wasn't aware that T-Mobile had an eSIM strategy already deployed and commercially available. Is that with multiple carriers here in the U.S. as well, outside of the Apple SIM, let's say? Not, not, not in the U.S. yet, but today we're working in all of the Americas and parts of Europe, so we can talk after. Perfect, thank you. Yes, sir. What's T-Mobile's opinion on all these new low power, low bandwidth IoT networks, LoRa, uh, LTE, M, Sigfox, et cetera? I think they can coexist, um, but, the, but we are Cat1 ready today, so we are addressing the market for the low power, low bandwidth devices, and we'll be uh, M1 ready 2017. And I think the answer is, is, is 5G, and enablement of 5G will perhaps maybe do away with the need for LoRa and some of those closed band networks. I would point out that you guys are keeping 2G open for a very long time, so those probably won't go away anytime soon. Um, say again? 2G. 
they're keeping 2G alive as everybody else is bailing out of it. They're keeping it alive. The, so the point is there's room for lots of different technologies because they solve different problems. They have different ways of communicating. They have different bandwidths. They have different frequency bands. And, and indeed, some of them have different limitations that have to be overcome. So it depends on the use case. There's certain uh, low power radio solutions that can only communicate you know, once every 15 minutes. Same thing that AMI, you know, automatic meter uh, infrastructure uh, can do based on here in the United States, FCC regulation. So it really depends on the use case for what you're doing and, and how you're sending the information. Because if I have to have a dog collar on my pet and I can only get an update on his position every 15 minutes after he runs away, that's not a good use case for that particular solution. So you're always going to have kind of a mixed bag of technologies based on the particular value and the use case you're going to be using it for. We had a question way in the back over there, so, sir. Don't you believe, at least, <clears throat> let me ask this, there is such a preponderance of interface technologies, you know, we have half a dozen inside the home, we have a whole bunch of WAN, a whole bunch of, of LAN protocols out there, and even though you may be able to make a case that each one has a particular use case in mind, isn't the plethora of so many uh, interfaces actually causing the low adoption rate for IoT? I, I would argue that it's actually, it's not the plethora of, of interfaces. I think there's a Darwin effect that's going to happen. The token ring will go away, right? The, the technologies that are less capable will fall away. Exactly right, and you had to you had to find your your survivor in that. You had to have enough value and reliability of that product to rise above the technologies that you have in the home. You're actually right. There's 15 standards in the home for communication, and they have different install bases. I'll, I'll say this about specifically about that challenge. I think it's a lot more difficult to actually get rid of a standard once you have installed products and specifically economics around that than it is, you know, oh, we're going to turn it off. There's a green field. Nobody's using it. We're going to turn that off. So they're going to exist for, uh, for quite a while, but everything is moving to IP. So technologies, our, our platform, our Axon platform is specifically built on that idea that there's all these technologies. We need to escalate that. We need to take that, translate it, and bring it up to a higher level so that all those things can actually look and talk interoperably to each other. I see yeah, and a I've question back there, and this unfortunately is going to have to be our last question as we're okay. now in the red zone. So. <laughs> red zone. <laughs> okay, I've got just a comment about the charging models for IoT because that's really important as well. And I was speaking to a startup the other day here in California where um, it's a farming model, and they've got all these sensors to, to sense the humidity and the light and the water and everything. And the first time they tried actual, they, they, and they bought a commercial sim, and I don't know who it was from. I don't think it was from you. And and they plugged it in, and the first month all those sensors generated 60 gigabytes of data and it cost them $3,000. And so they immediately threw away the SIM card and went to Sigfox. You know, so, so operators, you have one chance. And it can work technically, but if your charging model isn't right, you've lost them anyway. So don't forget that part. Good point. Thank you. And on that note of caution, uh, <laughs> I'd like to give a thank to our panelists. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having us. All right. And a round of applause, please.